My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. And today's video is on the subject of type 2 diabetes. And in particular, I wanted to talk about an incredible set of medications that have been shown to significantly reduce the risk of heart disease, kidney disease, and even death in patients with type 2 diabetes. I can guarantee that every single person watching this video will know someone who has type 2 diabetes. And I would urge anyone with type 2 diabetes to watch this video, as the medications I'm going to be talking about here are still not being used as often as they should, because many doctors out there are unfamiliar with their benefits. Just before I get started, I also wanted to say that as a thank you to all of you for allowing us to cross the 200,000 subscriber mark, I will be offering free consultations to some of my viewers and I will share details about this later on in this video. Now, diabetes is perhaps one of the oldest diseases in the world. And it was reported in Egyptian literature from 3,000 years ago. As our understanding has evolved, we now classify diabetes as type 1 and type 2. Type 2 diabetes is by far commoner than type 1 and is thought to result from a combination of genetic, environmental and behavioural risk factors. By behavioural, I mean lifestyle. People with type 2 diabetes are more vulnerable to virtually all forms of short-term and long-term health complications and even premature death. Moreover, the incidence of type 2 diabetes is reaching almost epidemic proportions. It is estimated that by 2030, there will be 450 million patients worldwide with type 2 diabetes. The majority of these patients will be in the 40 to 65 year age group. Type 2 diabetes is thought to be due to polygenic and lifestyle factors. In terms of lifestyle, we know that obesity contributes to more than half the number of cases. In addition, a sedentary lifestyle, poor dietary choices, smoking and excessive alcohol intake can all contribute. Currently, the method to look for diabetes is to use a blood test called HbA1c. And this test measures blood sugar control over time. And if blood sugar is over, if the HbA1c is over 6.5%, then a diagnosis of diabetes is made. And all efforts are made to reduce this number as a means of controlling the diabetes and minimizing its complications. It is, however, really important to understand that diabetes is a process and that the number is simply a guide to the process. Unfortunately, what has happened is that our emphasis on the number and managing that number has become more important than understanding and managing the process. This approach is incorrect because it makes certain assumptions which are wrong. We make the assumption that the process starts when the number goes up. By that I mean if your number is okay then we're told we don't have diabetes and if the number is up then we're told we do have diabetes. The problem is that the process may have started long before the number starts going up and therefore you may, you know, people who may have the problem going on may not be diagnosed. In fact, a lot of research says that up to 25% of patients with type 2 diabetes will have microvascular complications at the time of diagnosis, suggesting that the process had been going on for several years before the number reached the point where we make the diagnosis. Another problem with the approach of relying on the number is that it makes the assumption that if you control the number, you've controlled the process, and that by doing so, you're preventing bad outcomes for the patient. 
Now, when we look at all the studies, they suggest that yes, if you focus on just controlling blood sugar intensively, we do reduce the chances of microvascular complications such as eye disease and kidney disease. But there doesn't appear to be any overwhelming reduction in the risk of macrovascular complications such as heart attacks and strokes. And this observation may again lend credence to the idea that diabetes is more than just a number and that perhaps we should be understanding the underlying process better and treating the process rather than what is a surrogate, i.e. the HbA1c level. In fact, when we combine lifestyle changes with medications, we see better results. And perhaps that is because lifestyle measures probably address the underlying process better, whereas some of the commonly used medications perhaps just tackle the number. This is where this new set of medications that I wanted to talk about come in. These medications are called SGLT2 inhibitors, and they are being seen now as a game changer in diabetes management because they don't seem to have a dramatic effect on blood sugar levels, but they do seem to have a significant benefit in terms of cardiovascular and renal complications and events. SGLT2 inhibitors, SGLT stands for sodium glucose co-transport, co-transported two inhibitors, are a class of medications which are now commonly available and they were developed based on the discovery of a substance found in uh, the apple, uh, the bark of the apple tree. And this substance is called fluorazine. It's a natural product which can be extracted from the bark of the apple tree. And it has natural SGLT2 inhibitor properties. To understand that, we have to understand what this SGLT2 does. Now, in the kidneys, what would happen is usually, normally, about 180 grams of glucose is initially excreted into the, into the urine. But it, before it exits the body, it, most of it is reabsorbed. And the thing that allows it to be reabsorbed is this thing called SGLT. And therefore, even though the blood sugar is initially excreted, not much of it leaves the body. And so these particular SGLT stops the reabsorption of glucose and allows this extra glucose to leave the body via the urine. And therefore you lose up to 60 to 80 grams of glucose, which equates to about 240 to 320 kilocalories of energy daily. The effect of this is that the blood sugar levels go down, but in addition, there is a loss of weight. About 1.7 kilograms on average, 2.4% of body, fat, body weight. There's also loss of abdominal fat there's reduction in insulin resistance, and there is an improvement in metabolic parameters such as blood pressure, lipid values, so your serum triglycerides fall, your HDL, which is the good cholesterol, goes up. And what about major events? Well, there were some really interesting studies. Okay, There was a study called the Emperor reg study, where they took 7,000 patients who had type 2 diabetes and who'd had a previous cardiovascular event. By a ca previous cardiovascular event, the patient had had either a heart attack or a stroke or previous stents or a bypass or even significant peripheral vascular disease. And they took 7,000 of these patients and then they divided them into two groups. In the first, they added an SGLT2 inhibitor called empagliflozin to the usual treatment. In the second, they just gave them a placebo on top of usual treatment. And they then studied what happened to these patients, and they studied them for a median of about 3.1 years. And what they found was pretty amazing. The group on the empagliflozin, on the SGLT2 inhibitor, had a 38% reduction in cardiovascular death. So the investigators concluded that treatment with empagliflozin actually improved survival in type 2 diabetics who'd had previous events by 1 to 5 years. Furthermore, hospitalization for heart failure was reduced by 35%. And in addition to that, there were remarkable effects also seen on the kidneys. 
patients had less likelihood of worsening of kidney function, less need to initiate dialysis, and less renal death. Was this a one-off? No, there was another study called CANVAS, where they used another SGLT2 inhibitor called canagliflozin. And in this study, they took 10,000 patients, and again, they found similar results in terms of less cardiovascular events, less hospitalization for heart failure, and significantly less renal events. What about side effects? In terms of side effects, well, these medications obviously lower the blood sugar because they make you pass more glucose in your urine, and therefore there is an increased risk of hypoglycemia or causing excessively low blood sugars, especially if they're added on top of other sugar-lowering medications, other anti-diabetic medication. Another problem is because they're making more glucose pass through the urine, there's a higher risk of genitourinary infections, especially in female patients. And because they make you lose weight, and they may increase the risk of muscle loss in elderly patients, you need to be able to pass urine to, for these medications to work. And therefore, they're not really recommended for patients who have very, very bad kidney function or patients who are, are unable to pass any urine and are on dialysis. But otherwise, they sound very promising indeed. Uh, so in summary, here are the main messages that I wanted to highlight, okay? Number one, I, type 2 diabetes is a process, not a number. Number two, efforts at simply making the number look better with medications don't seem to translate into a significant improvement in cardiovascular events in patients with type 2 diabetes. Number three, lifestyle changes are important because they tackle the underlying process as well as the number. And before, these new medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, seem to tackle more than just the number in patients with type 2 diabetes and have been shown to dramatically improve prognosis in those patients who have type 2 diabetes who've had a previous vascular event such as a heart attack, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, bypass stents. So in summary, if you or um, anyone you know has type 2 diabetes, then I think it's a really good idea to go and speak to your doctors to see whether you may be eligible for this really exciting set of medications. I hope you found this useful. I'd love to know what you think about it and whether you found it uh, beneficial. Okay. Now, another really exciting bit of news. Earlier this year, in January, we reached 200,000 subscribers. And this is all because of you, who have been so kind and so supportive to me. And to thank you, I will be offering free 30-minute consultations to my viewers. Now, given my workload, I can only manage one a week. But if you are interested, please send a message, please send us a message via our Instagram page, which is hashtag York Cardiology. And we will choose one person at random and I will ring that one person every week, free of charge, and try and answer any questions they may have or any concerns they may have about heart issues. And this consultation will be 30 minutes long and it'll be completely free. You wouldn't pay for anything. Uh, this is just going to be an advisory service. It would not replace or oversee the doctor-patient relationship you share with your own doctor. Um, so if you're interested, please send us a message on hashtag your cardiology. And finally, I did post a scan on my community page on YouTube recently, and I asked people what it showed. And the answer is that what it showed was that one part of the heart, if you look at the side, one part of the heart is not contracting as well as the rest of the heart. And that's because the patient had had a heart attack and he's developed a scar on that side. So that's what it shows. So once again, thank you so much. And I totally, totally appreciate you. I appreciate you more than you will ever realize. You do more for me than, uh, than I can even... Uh, verbalize. So thank you so much. All the best.